Hello, welcome to this video from the MSc in Medical Education at the Swansea University Medical School. In this video we're going to be talking about learning styles and some other teaching techniques. I'm going to give you the punchline straight away and that is that learning styles don't work in the way that they're supposed to. However, for lots of reasons lots of people believe that they do work and they're very widespread in the educational literature. We're going to talk a bit about why that is. Specifically, the learning outcomes that I hope you're able to achieve by the end of this video are to describe the current theory of learning styles, to describe the current evidence base for learning styles, identify some reasons why belief in learning styles persists, identify some other techniques which are not supported by current evidence, and finally to link all those things above to a model of evidence-based education and the implications for educational practice. As always in these videos, we're going to be using as a framework our model of pragmatic evidence-based education where we take the most useful research evidence, apply our judgment about it, about where, when and how we might use that evidence and the context in which we might use it. The things we're going to be talking about in this video are things for which there is an abundance of research evidence, but the conclusions from that evidence are very clear. They don't work in the way that they're supposed to. Learning styles is what we're going to spend most of this video talking about. Many of these teaching techniques that aren't supported by evidence come from a good place and with good intentions. With learning styles, the place that they come from is the idea that everybody is different, which of course is true. What learning styles sets out to do is to capture those individual differences and harness them in a way that makes teaching more effective for individuals. There are lots of learning styles classifications, more than 70 of them, and here's a list of some of them, most of which will be familiar to you. Vark, Dun and Dun, Honey and Mumford, Kolb, and so on. Throughout this video, we're going to use Vark as our framework for explaining learning styles theory. Vark classifies people into one or more of the following styles. Visual learners apparently prefer learning through images, graphs and maps. Auditory learners through auditory information. Read-write learners through text in all formats. Kinesthetic learners prefer to pick up things and play with them. We need to be absolutely clear what the evidence base is and isn't for learning styles. What I just told you in the previous slide is that people have preferences for how they learn. That is evidently true. I have a preference for not ever reading an instruction manual and just pressing the buttons on things until they do the things that I want to. Other people like to meticulously read things before they ever turn on a new piece of equipment. Preferences are preferences. There's not any evidence to support or deny them. They are individual statements of opinion. What learning styles theory does though is it says if you prefer learning in a particular way, then that is the best way for you to learn. Now, there's lots of ways in which we can test this and that's been tested and there currently isn't any evidence to support it. We'll talk you through in a bit more detail why that is. If you think about, for our example, learning about the banjo. If we're learning about the banjo, that includes visual information. We need to learn to distinguish a banjo from other stringed instruments and a banjo has a very distinctive visual format. There's also text information in learning about the banjo. We need to learn to read music. We need to read the instructions about how to play the banjo or the history of the banjo or whatever it is we're learning. There's obviously some auditory information involved in learning about the banjo. It has a very distinctive sound compared to other stringed instruments. And when learning about any instrument, there is also obviously a kinesthetic component. We pick it up, we play with it, we interact with the strings and with the fretboard and so on. The key message here then is that when learning about the banjo, we need all four of these streams of information. It's not possible for us to do any meaningful or useful learning about the banjo using only one of these channels of information. Therefore, if we were, say, a visual learner and we tried to learn about the banjo only using visual information, we wouldn't get very far. This same principle applies to lots of the things that we want people to learn about, in particular in medical and health professions education. Most of the things we want them to learn involve multiple streams of information. Now, there are some things that come predominantly in only one stream of information. Let's say we're trying to teach students to learn to differentiate between different types of rash. A rash is a very visual source of information. It would be very difficult to learn what different types of rash look like using a podcast or some other auditory information. So if you're diagnosed as an auditory learner and you're asking for information or expecting to learn better using auditory information, you're not going to do very well when learning about things that are predominantly in a different format. Heart sounds are another thing. They're very predominantly auditory information. We listen to the sound of the heart. It would be very difficult to learn about different heart sounds using only visual information. 
That's just one of the reasons then why VARC doesn't work, because of the basic conceptual flaws when you try to put it to the test. There's another reason why VARC doesn't work, and that's because it doesn't work. One of the things about learning styles theory is it makes specific predictions that can be tested. Let's say we wanted to test VARC. We could take one group of learners, diagnose them into preferred learning style, and then take just two groups of them, let's say the visual learners and the kinesthetic learners. We could teach them all using one type of instruction, let's say we give them all kinesthetic instruction. The prediction from learning styles theory is that the kinesthetic learners should do better than the visual learners if they're all given the same test. That's been tested repeatedly, and there's no evidence to support the fact that it works. Here are some references which explain that in much more detail. We've known about this for quite some time. Back in 2004, there was a very extensive and detailed review written by Frank Coffield and colleagues at the University of Northumbria, where they answered this one specific question. Should we be using learning styles in post-16 education? What does research have to say to practice? They reviewed the evidence base for all of the 70 plus learning styles to try and answer this question. They produced a very long and very detailed and very thorough document. I'll save you the trouble of reading it by giving you what the basic punchline is. The answer is no. For all of the learning styles they identified, they did not come up with sufficient evidence to support their use in this way that I've described, matching the type of instruction, the type of teaching to a diagnosed learning style. Now, you'll notice that this paper was published in 2004. At the time that I'm sitting here, at the end of 2019, that's more than 15 years ago. Since the paper was published in 2004, there have been a significant number, over 30 different research studies, which we're in the process of synthesizing, asking people, educators, whether they believe in the use of learning styles in this way. In all bar one of the studies we've found, the majority of educators say that they believe that matching instruction to learning styles is effective. In most of the studies we've found, it's more than 80 or 90% of the people surveyed say that they believe in the use of learning styles in this way. Why is that? Does that matter? Is that important? One of the reasons is possibly, one of the explanations of this was possibly to be found in the following paper, which we did a few years ago. The first thing we did was just to look at how many papers there are about learning styles in the research literature. We looked in two different research databases, ERIC, the Education Resource Information Center, and PubMed, the Biological, Medical, and Life Sciences Research Database. In both cases, you can see that there are a number of research papers published about learning styles every year. In ERIC, the Education Research Database, it runs into the hundreds. In PubMed, there are fewer, but it's going up. There are still lots of research papers being published about learning styles. We analyzed a snippet of those research papers from 2013 to 2015, just trying to figure out whether those research papers endorsed the use of learning styles. And the punchline was that almost 90% of them did. Now, we're deep into the middle of this video and you may be thinking to yourself, he's just spent a few slides telling me that there's no research base, no evidence base for learning styles, and now you're telling me that 89% of research papers endorse the use of learning styles. That's a contradiction. What does that mean? What it means is that most of the research papers that are currently being published about learning styles take for granted the idea that learning styles are a good thing. Give you an example of the type of research paper that's published about learning styles currently. There'll be some situation where an educator has responsible for teaching a curriculum. Let's say they're teaching a bunch of pharmacy students at a particular pharmacy school. They'll give their students a learning styles questionnaire. They'll come up with the results of that questionnaire that a certain percentage of them, percentage of them are kinesthetic learners or auditory learners. And then they'll make some recommendations for the teaching of that subject on the basis of their learning styles results i.e. they're not testing learning styles. These research papers are running on the premise that learning styles are a good thing anyway. So one of the reasons why learning, why learning styles persists is because they persist. The learning styles theory has been around for 30 or 40 years. Lots of people have been telling us that it's a good thing and intuitively it does sound like it is a good thing. It's probably too late to put that genie back in the bottle, at least with any sort of speed. And so we're going to be stuck with this for some considerable time. There's a more important question for us as pragmatic educators about whether learning styles theory is useful. Unfortunately, the answer is probably not. One of the reasons for this is because diagnosing people into learning styles has been postulated to be associated with certain harms. If you take people and classify them into a restricted, narrow learning style, 
And one of the proposed harms is that you pigeonhole them. Let's say you take a bunch of learners and diagnose them using VARC, and you find that 25% of them are visual learners. One conclusion from that might be that that means they're not auditory learners, and so they're never going to be good at learning music, for example. Or you take the auditory learners. One conclusion that they might draw from being diagnosed as auditory learners is that they're never going to be any good at painting or at writing. Another proposed harm from learning styles is that since we know full well that they don't work, to continue to propose using them undermines the credibility of education as a profession and as a research activity. If we are diagnosing people into learning styles and trying to design different forms of our same educational material into people with different learning styles, then we're probably wasting our time. Resources are something that's precious in higher education, in particular in the education of health professionals, and so we really shouldn't be spending those resources and that time using techniques that demonstrably don't work. We also create unrealistic expectations in our students. Quite commonly in the feedback from some of our health profession students, we might read something along the lines of, I'm a particular type of learner and you're not teaching me according to my learning style. If students and educators expect that they have a particular learning style and we're not delivering information in that particular learning style, then we're going to create problems which are based upon a lack of evidence and an unrealistic expectation. I'll take you on to another study we did where we asked people about some of these harms and associated with the use of learning styles. In this study, we asked people whether they believed that matching to learning styles improved teaching. This was in a sample of educators in higher education and 58% of them said that they did. This is quite low compared to some of the other studies we've seen, but it's still a majority of educators in our sample of UK higher education said that they believed that matching instruction to learning styles was a good thing to do. As part of this research study, we then spent some time carefully and gently explaining to our participants that there is no evidence to support the use of learning styles in this way. We showed them some videos and showed you some of the research evidence that's been presented in this video. We then showed them some of the harms that I showed you in the previous slide. We asked them whether they agreed that these are potential harms associated with using learning styles in the way that we've described. And for all of the harms I showed you, a majority of them said yes. So we're in a situation where we've got a majority of people who believe in the use of learning styles. We've explained to them as constructively and politely as we can that there isn't any evidence base to support them. We've asked them whether they think that learning styles are possibly harmful, and the majority of them said yes, they do. We then asked them whether they were still going to use learning styles in the way that we'd asked them originally. And 32% of them said yes. Look at the contrast then between these two sets of data. We've gone from 58% down to 32%. We've explained to our participants there's no evidence base for the use of learning styles. We've explained to them that some people think that the use of learning styles is harmful and they've agreed with us that they are. And yet a third of them still say they're going to use learning styles. In this study, we also had a qualitative section where we asked people to leave us some free text comments. Lots of them gave us comments about why they were going to continue using learning styles. The most common theme that we found throughout the qualitative data was people suggesting to us that we need a diversity of methods when we're teaching our students. This is potentially interesting and very important when we consider what we're going to do about this widespread belief in the use of a teaching technique learning styles that isn't supported by the current evidence. The people who are telling us that we need to maintain using a diversity of methods have probably come to the conclusion that if we don't use learning styles, then we're not respecting individual differences in our teaching. That really isn't the case. There are plenty of ways in which we can account for individual differences when we're teaching our students. Learning styles are not a very good way of doing that because they diagnose students into a very narrow range of described learning styles that doesn't take into account the widespread differences in learning preferences that people have. I'm going to get a bit more into what this means for evidence-based education, but before I do, I just want to talk to you about a couple of other teaching techniques for which there isn't currently any good evidence. The first of those is the so-called cone of learning. It's a very busy slide, so I'll just let you have a look at it for a second. The punchline of the cone of learning is that there are various activities which are more effective than others. For example, we remember 90% of what we say and do. We only remember 10% of what we read, according to the cone of learning. There are some constructivist principles in here, and it's probably at the very heart of this, as with learning styles, a good intent. 
there's some good evidence to show that students who are actively engaged in their learning and are actively processing information possibly do better than students who are not. But there's absolutely no evidence to support the figures that are given on this triangular hierarchy. Overall, the cone of learning probably isn't useful as a way of organizing teaching. There's far better evidence about the specific activities which we've described elsewhere in other videos. Things like retrieval practice, interleaving, active learning, and so on. A similar principle applies to the idea of Bloom's taxonomy. You'd have seen in another video, we talk about the writing of learning outcomes as a good thing to do. Writing a description of what it is you want learners to be able to do by the end of a teaching session and using verbs within those learning outcomes that are specific and measurable. That way we can observe what it is that learners are able to do at the end of the teaching session and see if it matches what we, with what we want them to be able to do. Writing learning outcomes in this way is probably a good thing. It's a useful thing to do. It's a useful way of starting to organize our teaching. Bloom's taxonomy, from where this idea of learning outcomes first comes from, takes this one step further and organizes the verbs used in learning outcomes into a hierarchy. We start at the bottom with verbs that are associated with remembering and recall, basic factual information recall. As we all get, progress through our teaching, the idea is that we then move up the hierarchy so we end up at creating or other higher order levels of thinking and analysis. Although there is some basic common sense to the idea that learners at the beginning of a teaching session are better suited to learning factual recall, learners at the end of a curriculum or program are better suited to critical appraisal, there's very little evidence to support the specific levels of the hierarchy as shown here. Now, Bloom's taxonomy is probably different to the cone of learning and learning styles in that it's probably useful to think about writing learning outcomes using specific measurable verbs, and it's probably useful to think about some sort of progression in the nature of those verbs as we work our way through a curriculum. But it's not all that useful to stick rigidly to the hierarchy of outcomes as shown here. Let me give you a summary then of the content of this video. Ineffective methods are widespread. If you go onto the website of any university or many teacher training programs around the world and you search for learning styles, you're going to find material that endorses their use in the way that we've described here that isn't supported by the evidence. There's no evidence that it's effective. Using these sorts of uh, teaching techniques, waste resources, doesn't benefit learners and is potentially harmful. What does this all mean then for our model of pragmatic evidence-based education? The most important thing that it means is when you're looking for the most useful evidence, buyer beware. We have to be critical when we're appraising research evidence. There's often a tendency for many of us, and I've done this myself, to go onto a research database, put in a particular search term, come up with some research evidence and conclude, because it's been through the peer review process and it's in a journal, it must be credible, it must be valid. In lots of cases, unfortunately, that's not really the case premise, the foundation upon them which research is based, is flawed. And that's very much the case with the vast majority of research that's published about learning styles. It's not testing learning styles because it's based on the idea that learning styles are a good thing. Unfortunately, as we've seen, that's not the case. If you are then engaged in researching for some research evidence, some useful evidence to put into your model of evidence-based practice, use some of the tools that we've described in other videos to critically appraise the quality of the evidence. Praising the quality of, an ev of evidence is a good way of determining how useful it is. It's not the only way of determining whether or not research evidence is useful, but it is a very helpful tool. Here are some of the references we've cited in this video then, some of the research studies about learning styles, and some links to the, some of the images we've used. If you have any questions about the content of this video or about the MSc in medical education, please do send us an email. If not, I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.